Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We put together a guide with some recommendations to help you focus on being financially fit at different milestones in your life. Some of you may be ahead of schedule, while others may have to play catch up. You can download this guide for free on our website. The link to download Your Path to a Lifetime of Financial Success is listed in the episode description. Or you can go to wiserinvestor.com, scroll to the bottom, and find it there. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host, Michaela Dowdy. Hey, Michaela. Hey, Casey. Today, we are joined by Tom Townsend of Townsend Realty Group. Tom has been a guest with us on several episodes now. And today, we're going to talk about what financial planners wish you knew about buying your first home. So what better expert, no better expert than Tom Townsend? Well, thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Thanks Buying for having me back. First home, second home, third home, extra yeah. home. Yeah. Right. Investment property. And investment properties. That. That's right. <laughs> um, so let's just start right here, Tom. Uh, let's talk about what's happening in the real estate market right now. I, I'm, uh, I love real estate. I love looking at real estate. Um, so I, but I just pretty much do it from afar, right? Yeah. With uh, my Zillow app and my, uh, my realtor.com app. And I've just, as a non-expert in this, I've noticed that there hasn't been a whole lot of movement. Well, you're you're looking at it from a very regional standpoint. Very so. true. Yeah, well, neighborhood yes. standpoint. Well, exactly. And that's how you should evaluate <laughs> real estate because it is as, very local. Right. And that's the mistake that many people make is they hear and listen to the national news about real estate and right. what is happening on a national level. But really, in order to benefit yourself, you have to look local to yeah. find out what's going on. And it can be drastically different from one area to the other. So, so Marietta and Canton might be two different. It two could different be things happening. Or New York and Atlanta. True. Yeah. Or Portland, Oregon. Right. And Atlanta. Who wants could to be, be there? drastically different? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many people moving in. I, I wonder, like, where are they moving from? So some town somewhere has to have a real estate just bust. Yes. Well, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of migration across the country. Um, yeah. And actually internationally as well. I don't that, think that's a whole other issue. That's a whole uh, other podcast. Okay. Well, I didn't um, think like California was hurting in the real estate market. And uh, all these people are coming from California in New Jersey. Yes. But so yeah, both coasts, we're seeing both coasts migrating out Yeah, and we're seeing them moving into the Southeast. We're seeing them move into Texas. We're moving a lot of California, Southern California is moving down into Phoenix area and Arizona. So they're seeing a big boom there. So are there cheap houses where they're coming from? Um, I don't know about cheap. <laughs> We're talking California, right? I'm just I trying mean, to figure out where does, that. where does <laughs> Michaela, who's, who's, we'll say under the age of 25, where does Michaela buy a house? I, yeah. I can't figure this out. That's yeah. a long commute yes, from California. That's a great <laughs> that's great a question. Good, now we're going to get down to it. Right. Well, it's tough. I'll, hey, I'll be honest with you. First time home buyers, um, generation Z, if you will, if you want to call them that, uh, right. it's, it's tough. Does I mean, it you're really the last generation, generation Z. Is it generation yeah. Z? It oh, is. Man. Yes. I'm Gen Z. Okay. Gen Z. Gen Z. Yep. Do we just start over again? Do we go with the I think Gen they've a? started now where it's generation alpha and now they're about to go through the Greek alphabet, I think oh. is the plan. How convenient. I yeah. love these podcasts. I learned so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let's get back to the real estate market. <laughs> but it's tough. Listen, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I mean, it's it's rough. It's it's tough for the younger folks out there that are just getting started in order to get, to find a house. It really Which is. pushes more people to rentals. It does. And what you're paying in rent, you're basically is a mortgage, which is crazy. It is. It's actually a little bit more than a mortgage. Yeah. You know, and that makes sense if you think about it. True. Right? True. Okay. So, so anyways, uh, I buy a house a year from now. What's your prediction? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question, and I wish we all had a little crystal ball. That would be wonderful. The people do the same be... thing with me with the stock market, right? So I figured it's a fair game. But we can do some predictions. You know, I mean, yeah. we see enough. Um, I personally, uh, you may have your own opinion. I think the Fed has made it very clear that they want to squash demand in this market. And, and jobs. They're, and yes. they're doing a very good job at it. They're right. trying to kill the economy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they um, are. <laughs> so who knows where we're going to be? You know, we've got an election coming up. I don't know where that's going to fall. That's going to affect some things. Yeah, um, maybe. I don't yeah. I don't think there's as much in, on elections as people think that they are. Well, people Pe- are. But people, on, from a, maybe in real estate, because people feel better about the future because their candidate won, maybe. 
I, I think it's. I mean, people, Trump. Trump was Trump was terrible, right? Yeah. It, it, and there's some sarcasm in that statement. Yeah. But if Trump was terrible, and Biden was going to save everything, and now look at the markets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you, <laughs> so you can't use the same kind of psychology. All right. Well, here's, we, you know, and we're kind of getting away from the topic. <laughs> However, people are frozen. People are waiting. So there's not a lot of Cause movement. Because there's uncertainty. Because there's uncertainty in the market. So right. people are, because we have an election coming up, they're, they're just frozen with their decisions. They're not going to make any moves yet. Yeah. Because they don't know. There's that uncertainty that, they, that they're running into. But we're still holding at these... Is these high, at these high prices? We just we just stop climbing. Yeah, correct. Well, well, remember we're talking about supply and demand, just like any other market in real estate. And yeah. When we're talking about local, now we're talking local here, not nationally. Right. Within um, within you've, you've got Metro Atlanta. Yeah, I'm in the Metro Atlanta area. You've got the you've got the supply line, and then you mm-hmm. have the demand. And flashback six months ago, supply was right here, even, and demand was way higher. Yeah. Way high. Well, you the guys rates, will have to tune into the YouTube yeah, channel the YouTube to see channel his hands. We'll see, but there's a big <laughs> disparity between the supply and the demand. Demand is much higher than the supply. Right. Rates, the interest rate hike has brought that demand way down, almost even with the supply, but not quite. So where we're at today, there's still a little bit of a gap in between that, out. that equalization. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see if it gets even or even below that. We're just so, going to have to wait and see. This is just a theory I have. You tell me if it's true or not. So th- to get a FHA loan, there's mm-hmm. a maximum loan amount. I believe it's around 544000 It depends on your zip code, where you are. Yeah, uh, yeah, and they change it all the time. <laughs> Usually goes up, yes. right? Yep. As, so, as values go up, they adjust it to accommodate folks. So right. you could put down 10% and buy a $544,000 house, mm-hmm. and you'd be a conforming loan, I believe. Thereabouts, yeah. okay. So, if that were to go to seven fifty, mm-hmm. then I could see prices in that market jump instantly to seven fifty. Yes, if yeah, because you, you get into jumbo loan, the 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 lenders start crawling all up into your business. <laughs> jumbo jumbo loans a little harder to get. Correct. Right? Um, but they just increase the jumbo loan, the limit. The limit. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That so helps it's not too. a jumbo. You, you're not into a jumbo until I can't remember what the number is. Seven. It's okay. Seven something. So that's my point is that it's not just interest rates that are holding the market back, but it's also the fact that the lending limit of easy access has, has been moved as well. It has. And what you're seeing is you're seeing more and more lenders come out with different programs because they have to lend money in order to stay in business. Right. They're not going to sit on the sidelines and just go, oh, well, it's 7% now. Sorry. <laughs> True. Right? Yeah. Um, so they True. are starting to roll out some products in order to make it more appealing to folks and to lend. Yeah. They have to. They so have to. So I guess my point in going back to where where we are now in a fr- with a first time home buyer the reason why you can't find a $250,000 house is that $250,000 house has been pushed up into that half million $600,000 range it has yeah and i don't you know i listen to the experts um and we don't see a lot of pullback from that no there Although, will be no pullback from that there are people that are oh it's going to be another crash we're not looking at another I crash i do not believe that one said i yeah. think we're at a new baseline correct we might pull back a little bit. You might right. see a little bit of depre- you know, a little pullback from the last crazy two years that we've had in appreciation. Maybe, maybe in the one point six to two point five million dollar range. Yeah, you're gonna see some pullback. You know, yeah. there's a lot of buyers that I've, were in that buyer pool yep. that are no longer there. And so I've that seen, pool buyer pool is shrunk. And I've seen price drops. People are dropping prices in that price range. Correct. Above two and a half, I feel like that's a whole different realm uh anyway. And mm-hmm. those homes kind of do their own thing. Uh, two two point five, two point five, and, yeah. and above. Yeah, it's a totally different market. Yeah. So, if I hear what you're saying, is we have a good floor. Mm-hmm. We could see some prices come down, but nothing significant. There's nothing not, significant. Not a deal, unless you know it's like missing a kitchen or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. The roof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is you know, 
getting back to first time home buyers, you know, you've got to be open to those things. Yeah. If you are, you're going to have a lot more luck. You're going to have a lot more things to choose from. If you're willing to put a little sweat equity, we're talking about, you know, going back and yeah. putting a little sweat equity into a home in order to have one. Right. But if you're willing to do that, you're going to have a lot more options. Okay. I mean, I think that's my, I think that's a fair assessment. I, I you know, there, there's so many different angles we could, we could, take on on that I, I think from maybe you're not a first-time home buyer and you're just listening to the podcast but um investment properties like to me if i want to pay seven percent because typically it's a one percent markup on investment property loans right so at I'm least yeah seven percent for an investment property that's going to be a rental or like mm-hmm. a long-term rental that doesn't make sense to me the only way you can make money on that unless unless you're putting down a big chunk which then i question that too um is the price has to keep going up. We've talked about this on prior podcasts. I don't see that price moving up. I think that the rentals are going to be the homes with a lot of hair on it and probably some sweat equity and some remodeling, the traditional format, right? Uh, but ultimately, I think it's vacation homes. I think that's where you that's where you want to be putting your money. Uh, you disagree? I kind of disagree. I do. So why the, do you the think investment not- properties are a totally different beast than your home that you're living I'm in? I'm just looking at the ROI. Well, what, are what's you look, the, the S and P five hundred going to be on the next ten years versus a a, a rental property going to get? Well, what, are years? you looking at appreciation only, or are no. you looking at cash flow? I'm looking at cash flow. I'm just saying at seven percent interest, the cash flow, and and, and and there is a cap at what you can rent things out at, right? Yeah, I mean, there's always a cap on any market. However, you've got so many three bedroom, different... two bath, twenty five hundred a month. Is that pretty standard? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So as long as you're, you know, the interest rate that you're paying, as long as um, all the other factors that you're looking at with an investment, and we're talking about investment properties, we're yeah, totally different than yeah. I know. We just changed podcast like investment properties. Say. It's my podcast. We do everyone. But you have appreciation, <laughs> so you have built in appreciation that you can kind of count on, right? You know, th- you're saying let's get back to reality and say that we're talking about three, four percent a year, right? You've got unlocked appreciation, and that is, does the, can you improve the value of the property by buying it and doing some improvements and getting creative with it? Right. So as they're unlocked appreciation, then you have depreciation. You get a tax benefit with investment properties. Yeah. You get a write-off. Yeah. And it, that can be significant. Well, only if you don't give it up when you sell it. Only if you if you do a 10, 1031. 1031 exchange. Yeah. If then you that roll makes it over, that makes sense. That does. However, if you're in it for the long haul, Absolutely. it's an investment. You always, you know, you're in it for the long haul. Yeah, you Just don't do like, this for five years. And move no, on. you don't. And then you've got the cash flow. So you've got a multiple different channels of value or revenue on an investment property. And a lot of people get hung up on, what well, does it cash flow? Yeah. That's all they look at. Is it positive cash flow? Yes or no? Well, you... You do need positive cash flow or else you're out of pocket every month. Well, yeah, but if your appreciation is going to make that up and the depreciation is going to make that up. So now let's talk about the internal rate of return. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's a different conversation, but you've got to think like an investor and not necessarily just someone that's buying a rental property for the cash flow. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. But see, if, if I go down to the beach and I buy an overpriced rental... Well, if you pay overpriced, you're... I can. Well, they're all overpriced. They're always overpriced. It seems like, according to who? <laughs> the market, because yeah. that's the who determines the value. Uh, of the I market. know. I'm saying that more sarcastically. <laughs> it's just you're like five hundred thousand for this. Like, where? Where's the bedroom? It's a studio. Yes. <laughs> oh, I don't. It's a hotel room. That's what it is. Yeah. It's five hundred thousand dollars. It is. <laughs> and who rents these? <laughs> Family of five. I don't know who rents those yet, right? Yeah. But anyway, so I I see it as um, I can adjust the, I can adjust the rental, like I can adjust faster to people paying more to go on vacation, versus a long term rental where I have to wait for a year or two years to be able to adjust the. It, well, the exactly. Yeah, and, and um, I guess I can get some personal use out of it too. Well, you can, you can. Um, but however, when you do short term, you're talking about short short term rentals. rentals. Yeah, um, you have higher risk because your vacancy rate is high. That's true. So you've that's got, true. You've got that. Yeah. Right? yeah Long term rental. I, I'm going to put somebody in there for 12 months. At any given time over the next five years, I may have a vacancy for maybe two months a year, yeah. one month a year that I've got to budget in two percent vacancy rate. But they damage your typical. property. You keep their deposit. 
they damage all... my property, their insurance has got to pay for okay. <laughs> the there's, immediate. There's pluses, there's and, minuses pluses and, minuses and minuses. Yeah. Right? And then, so I know, like at the beach, you're talking about the beach. I'm talking, you know, yeah, North or Florida, yeah, beach or, or nice mountains. Yeah. Okay. Well, your vacancy rate there is probably more like 40%, 30 to 40%. Yeah. So well, at least at the beach, you can get, well, you used to be able to get snowbirds. I don't know if they're letting them yeah, out anymore or back in, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they let them out, but they don't let them. Canada doesn't let them back in. I think that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all snowbirds are from Canada. There's, like there's some up people there. pouring across the Mexican border, and the Canadians don't even let their own citizens back into their own country. It's pretty, yes. funny. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's a crazy world. This is a crazy world. Um, I, you know, okay. So, Michaela, I asked all these questions. Got yeah. figured out your plan, yeah. right? So, here's what you're gonna do, Michaela. <laughs> you're gonna buy an investment. You're, you're gonna keep Down renting. You're gonna keep renting here. You're gonna buy a property where you want to retire someday. You're gonna rent it out. Let someone else pay the mortgage. Right, and then and then you have a paid off home at retirement, and then you just stop renting once you're here. And that's called house yeah. hacking. <laughs> you, house you buy a house and you fix it up, and you rent, find, find some find a roommate, right, and have there them you pay go. your mortgage for you, right. Hey. That's have right. a little mountain house somewhere. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Just put it in a rental program and and uh, go visit it every now and then. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's get let's get back on topic because right. Tommy, you and I could talk for hours. Yes, we could. Um, am I financially ready to buy a home? This is on our episode outline here. Um, you know, here's here's the thing: home home purchase. First of all, <laughs> let's go back to our old topic: passive income. There is no passive income. Okay, I have a I have a vacation rental property. There's nothing passive about that place. I don't think I've ever enjoyed it one time. I think I, maybe one time, mm -hmm. but I go up there, I fix stuff, clean mm -hmm. out gutters. I do stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I'm also a busy body. So we'll yeah. handicap it a little bit there, but there is no passive rental income. In fact, I don't think there's any such thing as passive income. I mean, maybe, maybe dividends from a company stock, but then there's also the anxiety that you own company stock. So, you know, I, you know, right. You see what I'm saying? I, I see where you're coming from, but, but yeah, but ultimately, yeah. um, my point is that home, you have to maintain a home. So it, it's, it's kind of like buying the late model BMW because you got to have a BMW and then you get shocked when you go in and brakes are $5,000. Yeah. Right. It's like, you got to pay to play. Yeah. And this is, this goes back to your <laughs> conversation of why are rent so much higher than your mortgage payment? Well, right. because rents, you don't have those expenses to maintain the property. Correct. When you own a property, you do, you've got to budget that in to your right. Your finances. Or maybe you're really bad at maintaining stuff. Mm -hmm. That's another thing to think about. Yeah. Yeah. The homeowner now has the burden of maintaining yeah. that, that property. We all have that neighbor, right? Just really bad at maintaining stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have that neighbor. <laughs> Actually, that used to, did, did that used to be you at your house? What? Have you always maintained your houses to the T? Um, yeah, pretty okay. much. I mean, I take I a lot of pride in I it. I figured you would. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You just kind of looked at me like, like, no. Maybe that's me. <laughs> well, I was, thinking my, I was thinking of my neighbors, and they were listening to this podcast. I'm like, I gotta be careful here. That's I've got funny. great neighbors now. What do they do? So, so yeah, I, I think it's um, you, you have to be ready to to make make those payments. I don't I don't have a rule of thumb on that. I I, I just know that you probably should budget five hundred to a thousand dollars a month to do stuff around your house. Yeah, I think you have two categories. You have um, expenses, monthly expenses. But then you also have long-term expenses, those yeah. capital expenditures that you yeah. got to plan for. The new roof, driveway. Correct. Driveways, driveways are painful. I replaced mine a few years ago, and I just want I spent so much money, I just want to sit in a lawn chair in the driveway just staring at it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a driveway. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> People drive by, like, nice driveway. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's an old man thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so you, you got to have some free cash flow. It's not that can you afford the mortgage. It's can you afford the mortgage and afford to um, uh, pay for the or pay for repairs and maintenance, right? And I wish our industry did a better job at preparing people for the expenses of home ownership. And yeah. we really don't do that good of a job. They need we little stickers people. on the front of the doors like they do with appliances. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you buy this washer, it's going to cost you $50 a year to operate it, right? They'd say the estimated cost of this house is, right? Because you hear you don't hear about it at our, at our homes, but you hear about it like movie stars, right? It costs it cost them 50000 a month to maintain the yes. $50 million mansion. Yes. And you're like, oh my, oh my God, $50,000 a month. That? That's crazy. Yeah. 
But yeah, there's always something to do. Yeah, there is. If you want perfection, for sure. There is. There is. And what if you're not a DIY guy? I mean, what Gotta if you gotta be a DIY guy? Uh, no, I mean we've <laughs> had we've had prior employees here that were younger guys that I've just like, hey guys, we got this new desk and we got put together, and you would have thought I said, hey, yes. let's reassemble the space shuttle and go to outer space. Yes, I <laughs> I agree. And I'm just standing there going, oh my god, like your future wife is going to hate you. It's just a different era, <laughs> you know. It really is. You don't know, know how they, to use the Allen yeah. wrench. <laughs> yeah. She just said Allen know. wrench. Allen <laughs> wrench. That's, I'm impressed. You're That's advanced. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. You're yeah. advanced. Being the only daughter to an engineer has its oh, benefits. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yes. So you know the Phillips head and the flat head yes, difference. Yes, I do. Yep. Wow. Had to go through that because, you know, it's normally the son that's behind you <laughs> handing you the wrong <laughs> tool. So I was the daughter handing the wrong tool. Right. So I quickly learned. <laughs> Interesting. I love it. I love it. Now so. we know who's assembling desk around here. Yeah. Going <laughs> yes. Not to change the topic yet again. But <laughs> okay. But but no, they need these stickers. This house costs X amount to maintain. Well, right. and you know, I'm going to I'm going to blame um, HGT. TV, you know, uh, for a lot of that. Chipping Joanna? Yeah. Don't so bring them into this. Everybody what? wants that house. And so we work oh. with a lot of first time home buyers, and that's they walk conceptually in. what they want. Well, that's what they're looking for. Oh. And we have to, you know, unless your their budget is seven fifty, yeah. Um, we have to bring them back to reality and say, Okay, probably not gonna get a perfectly right. maintained and beautifully updated home. Right. So let's have a little flexibility. Um, and some folks don't like the DIY, you know, yeah. approach and other people's are, people are perfect, perfectly fine with it. So, yeah, if you want it the way you want it, you probably got to have a hundred grand in your pocket and then you got to buy the house. Yeah. And so that's a lot of money to save when you're young. And that's another issue that we're running into is the expense of all these improvements have drastically gone up over yeah. the last year, year and a half. So right. most people are estimating way too low what it's going to cost to replace appliances and flooring and oh yeah paint. I'm sure you know they're thinking oh I don't know three grand for appliances no <laughs> that'd be your refrigerator Ma on yeah, sale that's a sale <laughs> that's a, a, a scratch and dent <laughs> right <laughs> refrigerator right now so those are the shocks that people are 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 realizing right now and um, so yeah we have to work through all that so, so once again I it's not getting I think the safe, I think the safe thing to do is, is, is really take Dave Ramsey's approach. You need to be debt free. You, you need to be out of the credit card debt, get rid of the student loans, get rid of all clear, the clear the decks before you make that home purchase. But here's the kicker. Um, you know, I really want people to get a 15 year mortgage. I wish someone had told me get a 15 year mortgage. Mm -hmm. I have, I have one now. Well, it's like 10, but I, when I refinance, when the rates rates are really low, um, I, I did a, I did a 10 year on one home, 15 on the other, because you just save hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest, yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest. I mean, it's just, you know, if you can't afford the 15 year, maybe you just don't buy the house. Yeah. Or if you have a job that is, um, somewhat volatile in income, you have good years, bad years, do the 30 year, but then make that auto payment to get it paid off in 15 years. Um, it just, you don't, you don't want to be house poor in the long run. Um, but I wish someone had told me that there is a mm. little bit of an interest rate savings it used to be a bigger difference, um, between a 15 or three year interest rate, but maybe it's only like a quarter point now. And we're in this weird, um, interest rate environment right now too. So it changes mm -hmm. rapidly and it changes daily, yeah. you know, hourly sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you, yeah, I, I would encourage everyone to do a 15%. Or, sorry, a 15 year mortgage. Uh, it's gonna be a little harder at six and a quarter, six and three quarter interest rate. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would make that a make that a goal. Uh, and you'll every statement that you mortgage statement that you get, you're gonna see a tick down in the mortgage mm -hmm. principal balance. Not 30 year, <laughs> it doesn't move much. You get the end of the year and you're like, that's all I paid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, that'll save you 15 years of of payments and save you um, you know, depending on the value of the home or the loan, uh, Two hundred something thousand dollars in interest. It's crazy. Yeah, and I piggyback on that just a little bit. We talked about investments, yeah. like an investment property, right? Your personal property for the majority of people is not an investment property. Oh no way! 
not an investment yeah. property. So we work with a lot of folks that get that confused. We'll go out, we'll start working with them. And they're thinking, well, they're thinking it as if it's an investment property. And it's like, hang yeah. on, this is, this is a lifestyle. This You're doing this from an emotional standpoint, yeah. which is really why you buy a house. Right? As much you money as I put into family. my primary home, uh, there is no, I have to live two <clears throat> lifetimes to make yes. the money back out of my. <laughs> so don't confuse the two. <laughs> right. Do not, you know, we're always talking about, we cannot confuse the two. It's yeah. two totally different approaches to real estate or a, a, a property. I always tell people, when you remodel the kitchen, are you going to go based on what the um, market wants you to have in a kitchen? Or are you going to do a kitchen that you like? Yeah. And they're like, I'll build the way I want it. Yeah. Like, well, there you go. There you go. You may not like gray. That's right. <laughs> or it's not even gray anymore. It's <laughs> it's like this light tannish color is the is yeah. the end color now. Yeah. Um yeah, no, your your primary home is never a never an investment. I think some people get lucky. I mean, we have clients out on the West Coast that bought um uh, in Seattle, they they bought a home, inherited a home uh that they bought from the family at market rate. Okay. Uh, and then that home was sold. They bought another home in West Seattle, and I think they paid like six hundred thousand. Two years later, they think they sold it for one point two. Okay. Because of all the tech moving in, yeah. so you hear stories like that. That is an investment at that point. They had to pay capital gains tax on. Well, in the last <laughs> few years, even here locally, I mean, we've been spoiled. I mean, our yeah. appreciation has jumped through the roof. So it gets people thinking, "Holy smokes, this is an investment property." We're not going to see that no. appreciation year over year over year. We're just not. It's going to pull back, and it's pulling back right now. So, anyways, we talk to people all the time about don't get confused with your home that you're buying to live in as yep. an investment property. And so we'll sit down, and we'll talk with folks about what their must-haves are. Mm -hmm. And usually there's three to five must-haves that you have in your next property. And if there's two people involved with the purchase, we'll have them do it separately. And interestingly, they don't line up sometimes. So that's uh, another conversation that we have to have. Yeah. So one of one of them usually is looking at it more of an investment, like it's got to, you know, I want a return. It's got to have this. And yeah. It's got to have all the right things. And the other person is more like, I want a big backyard. I want some place for the kids to, to play. So it's kind of interesting, but it's a dynamic conversation that you have to have with clients. Yeah. So um, you're going to have to, you're buying a place that, I mean, if you're having a family, you're buying a place that um, you're going to create memories in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the house we live in now, I don't know. I mean, to me, it's just an okay house. I don't love the house is what it is. Um, but I didn't buy it because I love the house. I bought it because the backyard's big. Yeah. <laughs> and it's flat. <laughs> and I remember standing there looking at it going, you know, we, we'd had, uh, we only had one child, one on the way when we moved in. I'm thinking, I don't know what's going to happen in this backyard, but it's going to be cool. <laughs> it's got a putting green now. <laughs> it has a putting green now. That's right. But it was a football field for a while, and we would paint stripes, uh, you know, stripe football field, like all the stripes. And sometimes yes. we got creative with logos. And so we, we played backyard football. We had uh, – there is one tree that gets in the way, but we do have uh, backyard baseball set up. Um, when they redid the – the front portico, they had a lot of stones left over. So we painted them white and yeah. it just came like permanent bases until the lawn guys complained that they were you yeah. know, running over them and messing up the lawnmowers. But uh, yeah, it can be a makeshift baseball field. And then, yeah, there's a, there's been multiple putting greens. We're on the second one. Now the first one was real and don't ever do that. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't like real putting surface. It was just really tight. Um, uh, Bermuda. Yeah. And so you could sort of put like the old videos of all Palmer and the bob, the bob, the ball would bobble back and forth. As yes. You it. yes. Uh, and yeah, that, that kind of lived its life. And then, uh, during COVID we had nothing else to do. So we rented a Bobcat and, um, we put in our own green. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Wow. That's pretty cool. Driving the Bobcat was my favorite. I tore I, the I whole backyard, say. man. <laughs> I had to replant all the grass after, after fortunately we just had fescue, but yeah, it was it was it was fun, but again, memories. My point right? is, this is why you buy a house. <laughs> That's why you buy a house. That's you're, why you're buying you're your primary memories. residence. A, a right friend there. of mine bought up in Woodstock when nobody was buying Woodstock. He has like a little mini farm up there, right? Yeah. So it, it's it's um he's building memories with gooses and geese or whatever they call yeah. them. Uh, and I should have done that actually, looking back on it. But I didn't know that my daughter was going to do horses, so. <laughs> Now it's ridiculous. I could, no way I'm buying a mini farm. Yeah. But um, 
yeah, so you know you have to think about those things, and and ultimately, I think that's what you you use those what you want for the future as your motivation. That's why you got to get rid of. That's why you don't have Amex credit card debt at twenty nine percent. That's why you're eliminating that student loan. That's why you're maybe drive a car that you're not making a payment on. Maybe it's not the best car on the road, but you know what? Your goal is to buy a house. You know, if you're in your twenties, I'm talking to the younger yeah. kids now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, use the thermometer on the, on the refrigerator wall that, well, that doesn't work anymore because it's all this clean steel, but your thermometer up on a, some, some door somewhere and you're shading in how much you've got for your goal. And you just charge ahead and saying, this is what I want for my future. This is what I want for my family. Yeah. Um, and, and you go and you save that down payment. Um, speaking of down payments, if you put down 10%, you're probably going to have an additional payment on your mortgage called PMI. Correct. So basically the bank is concerned that um, if they have to repossess the home or if there's a problem with the title that, right, because it's mortgage insurance is what it is, right? Well, I think that's, I don't know if that's separate or not. I think mortgage title insurance title, is title insurance, insurance. That's true, but the bank takes, well, no, you buy that at closing, I think. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it's a really lump cheap, sum. It's really cheap, though. It's pretty cheap, usually. Oh, uh, well. Well, it's all uh, relative. Maybe, maybe not anymore. A couple thousand bucks, maybe. I was about to say, maybe uh, not it, anymore. There's a ratio. It's a... But you're going to pay PMI until your house has at least Correct. 20% equity in That's it. That's built in every single month. And some some banks are going to turn that off at a certain point in the amortization schedule. Some banks will allow you to get your house reappraised for a few hundred bucks to show that you have at least 20% equity. Um, that payment will vary from bank to bank. To bank. Uh, I did not know this um, until many years ago when I was shopping. If I did something through the credit union, my PMI was like 35 bucks, And I used um, some local bank got a quote from them and theirs was going to be $300 yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, and I, my understanding is I'm not an expert on the on PMI part, but there's two different choices and the credit unions tend to go with one choice where the, the banks are doing something else or maybe well, yeah, credit unions or operate. You, you may know this more than I, but I know credit unions operate differently and under different rules than a bank. True. So um, True. that may have something to do like with it. I feel like they sell their mortgages to each other though, but I don't know. They do. Um, I just noticed that it was cheaper. So ultimately you want to have 20% down um, if you can. If you That's can't, optimal. If you can't, then maybe have a plan to accelerate those payments to, to get that PMI off because that, that's almost money wasted, um, really. But in this market, if you're trying to get in, you get the 10% down, try to do a 15-year. Um, that would get rid of PMI really fast if you do a 15-year mortgage. Um, correct. Because you're paying, I'd have to check with a mortgage well, you're, person. You're paying down so much faster. I don't even know if you can get a PM, I don't PMI 15-year. Yeah, do think they force you into 30? I Probably. I don't know that for a fact. That would be something to yeah. look into. I don't know. We have connections. We can figure yeah. out. Well, it's a whole other podcast. It's only a phone call. Well, <laughs> bottom line is twenty percent down, no other debt is is really what you're looking for. Yeah. And I might, you know, just again on this mortgage conversation. Yeah. There's programs rolling out every single day, especially now with the rates increasing. More and more different programs are rolling out. Yeah. So and if you're a first time home buyer, which doesn't mean you have to be this is the first time you ever bought your home. It just has to have been so long since you bought a home last, is my understanding. But if you're a first time home buyer, um, there's actually additional credits for that as well. Correct. Once again, different programs are rolling out all the time. So this is why you don't go to your bank for a mortgage. You find a mortgage broker who understands the different um the yes, different programs all the different options available. so a broker will be able to show you all the different options yes. that are out there a bank has one option and it's very usually very narrow right their requirements to get qualified are typically higher than you would find with a broker correct so i always encourage everybody to work with a mortgage broker yep it's not a middleman it's not an additional layer of expense it's actually Actually, they have a lot, a much wider breadth of options for you. And you have, um, you have connections. We have connections. Uh, people can reach out to us. We're yes, happy absolutely. To tell you who the good people are. Um, how do you know you're not overpaying for a house? Is that even possible? Well, it is. Um, the easy, quick answer to that is most everybody that will be buying with a loan is going to get an appraisal. Ah, so that's your true. security blanket right there. So, um, Flashback six months ago when things were crazy and we heard all these stories about people paying 50, 60, $100,000 over asking. Mm -hmm. If 
It was built into the contract that you wrote because you can waive this right. Um, however, if you've got an appraisal contingency on the offer that you made, it's going to be contingent on the appraisal. So you're going to, you have that security to come back to. Let's say you, you offered $400,000 for a house and you feel like afterwards you have a little buyer remorse. You're like, holy smokes, I don't know if this thing's going to work. And the appraisal comes back at three fifty, Then you have to go back to the seller and you renegotiate the difference. Yeah, Either right. you come back to the appraisal price, you pay the difference in cash or you say, eh, this isn't going to work for either party. You tear it up. You get your earnest money back, and you, you keep on moving on. So, you, I mean, that's the short answer. You're going to have an appraisal, somewhat type of an appraisal coming back and getting everybody back down to reality. What or, happened? Or what's, <laughs> what was crazy was that the appraisals wouldn't match. The people would close anyway with additional cash. They were waiving the appraisal contingency. Yeah. We had to in order to win the house. That's if I, crazy. If I had a buyer that had to buy a house, I would... I, yeah. We would sit down with them and say, listen, here's the risk. If right. the appraisal doesn't match what you offered, are you willing to pay over and above what the appraised value is? Everybody was saying, yes, I'll pay uh, 60 over. I'll pay 70 over. Right. I've lost five houses already. Yeah. I need a house. Right. So that's what was happening. You know, that's another benefit to these higher interest rates and in a little slower environment. I think you have time to think now. It's such healthier. It's so much healthier. Everybody's, so don't get, I think it's great. It's yeah. that supply and demand balance that we were talking about earlier is coming more in balance. It was so imbalanced. Yeah. And it was unhealthy. Anybody that was out there over the last couple of years trying to buy a home felt it. It was not fun. Right. It really wasn't. So it's it's getting back to reality. Um, we're just going to have to find out what these rates, how much these rates really are going to affect that demand side. Um. You know, we've got some, we have this whole YouTube channel. Did you mention that already? <laughs> <laughs> Tell uh, me more. <laughs> so we, a couple of things you can find in our podcast notes. Uh, should I pay off my mortgage? Um, how to leverage assets to buy a home. These are all different videos we've done on the YouTube channel uh, linked below. Also, uh, episode 17, we did real estate with Tom Townsend. That was a long time ago, Tom. What, was it? Yeah. We're in episode 133 now. It's crazy. Wow. Episode 51, is there a looming real estate crash? We did that as well. Episode 9, uh, all things mortgages with Mary Ansley Sutherland. That's uh, that's a good one, talk, talking just generally about mortgages in, in general. Mary Ansley is not uh, practicing uh, right now, but we have a new mortgage broker we can uh, refer you out to or use, use Tom's. Um, you can also find uh, townrg.com. That's uh, Townsend. Tom Townsend, Townsend. Townsend Realty Group. Yes. Uh, Tom and his team would be happy to help you navigate this market with a purchase or a sale. Tom just sold uh, my next door neighbor's house. Yes, I did. My next door neighbor. I didn't review any of their information or balance sheets. Didn't screen them. Is that legal? <laughs> Maybe that's why you didn't offer. Uh, you sold it what? Two days? One day? It was like a three day. Three, three days. Three days. Three days full asking price. There's no better. Very, this was just a couple weeks ago. So those yeah. situations are still occurring. Yeah. Now that was a beautiful home. All right. The so owner six. has the owner needed to sell that home in order to get her life back because she she everything that came every, every she she took into she was a great homeowner. How about yes, we go with that? <laughs> there was not she's a she was a great neighbor too. Um but no, she just she needed to be free of the burden of home ownership. Yeah, she was and, ready and, for that. And move to a place that she could manage easier. Yeah, absolutely. And it but, was uh, it's a beautiful home. So once again, we're getting in our local market, we're getting back to the basics. Well, uh, quality is gonna sell any quality day. and a beautiful home uh right. is going to sell. Right. So yeah, quality will move, I think, in any market, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, but no, there's no testament to your skills other than your results. And that was, uh, that was very quick. Hopefully. It was quick. Hopefully. In, a, in, a very, <laughs> in a changing, a very quickly changing market. So we were very pleased. Yeah. I was and very happy for things her. Things in our street don't come up very often. So I knew that it would sell pretty quick. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. So we, we've got, we've got all I this. also helped your grandmother. Right? Oh, my mom. Or your mom. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You saw my mom's house, and that was in a couple of hours, wasn't it? Yeah, that was that was quick. That was in the middle of the mayhem. Yeah, you got multiple offers. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, that was, a, you know, that was. Like I'm trying six, to forget that move, ago. man. I'm trying to forget that move. <laughs> I know Sorry. my mom listens to my podcast. Love you, mom. <laughs> but that, that was, um, that was quite the undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It's I mean, like. And it worked out for her, right? Yeah. No, great. she is so happy now. Yeah. She's down in uh, Bluffton, South Carolina, near my sister, who is in, um, uh, just off of Hilton Head on one of the little islands out there. Kawasi Island. Mm -hmm. Is that right? No, not Kawasi. Anyway, I forgot the name of the island. Okay. She's um, it's near Spring Island. They they connect. But, uh, yeah, that was a crazy move. I mean, my mom lived in a two-bedroom, two-bath house or condo. And the deal was I'd, I'd visit, we, we, had a, we hired a packer. And she kept saying, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of stuff in here. And then I, ordered, I got the largest, the largest U-Haul truck you could possibly find. It was 26 foot, 24 foot. Yeah. And then I had a full busy day here running the global headquarters of Wiser Wealth <laughs> Management, right? And, and uh, I put my son in charge of supervising the movers. And he calls me like halfway through the day and he goes, Dad, they filled up the first truck. I mean, we mean the first truck. They said they assumed there another truck was coming. I'm like, I can only drive one truck at a time. <laughs> And so I had to run down and uh, rent a whole nother truck. And my sister had to come up for it, on a 24 hour turn. So they came up and we had to drive two trucks in the middle of the night. Oh, wow. And then I got there and I was like, mom, you got to like thin out. <laughs> I'm convinced U-Hauls are wrong though. When I moved, on the, no, on the side of the U-Haul it says three rooms. It does. Okay. And I got one for mine. And it no, was it, for said a two, it said five rooms. Mine said it was for a two bedroom apartment. I only had a one bedroom apartment worth of stuff and I didn't yeah. even have a lot of stuff because I had already taken my clothes and stuff separately. It Yours was just fit? furniture and it did not fit. I had to get someone, I had to get my fiance Drew to literally get like bring his forerunner and we packed it down too. Oh, it was wow. like insane. I was like, this is so not maybe correct. it's not my mom entirely. It's, maybe no. it was, it's false advertising yeah. on the side of U-Haul trucks. Yeah. I don't know. I'm Who suspicious. U-Haul doesn't know furniture anymore. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I'm suspicious. <laughs> All right, guys, funny. good conversation. Uh, see you next time. Thanks for coming in, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to a wiser retirement podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We would also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. We would love to hear from you. This episode was produced and edited by Lil Tim Moore. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or a solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk, and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.